Hey everybody, welcome to Rock and Roll Shinsu Chu, episode number 82. Woo! All right. Good to see you guys. How are you? Pretty good. Good, yeah. good, 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 good. Sorry. Um, well, good to be back, everybody. Got a really, really exciting show tonight. Um, very, very special guest. Jonathan was fortunate enough to interview last week the director of the upcoming uh, Pearl Jam concert film, Let's Play 2. I'm talking about famed rock uh, rock photographer Danny Clinch, rock photographer and filmmaker Danny Clinch. Uh, Danny's photographed the likes of obviously Burl Jam, Bruce Springsteen, Fish, uh, and and just a slew of others. So you can check out his work. Um, so we're really excited to share that tonight. Um, Jonathan was fortunate enough to talk to him next week about the Pearl Jam documentary. Last and, yeah, last week. I'm sorry. Next week. Jeez. <laughs> um, anyway, sorry. I'm tired. Um, so Jonathan was lucky enough to talk to him last week and talk a lot about the Pearl Jam documentary as well as some other cool things that Danny's working on. So um, appreciate him uh, dropping by the show. Uh, first, we're going to do a little grab bag where this is where each of us just pulls out sort of a random topic uh, related to baseball or music. And the other co-hosts have, uh, they're not aware of the topic prior to its announcement. And then we'll do our show your cards segment at the end. So let's kick this off with our grab bag. Uh, Levi, why don't you begin? Um, my grab bag this week involves something we all love, and that's baseball cards. I, um, I, I'm going to save a card for my show your cards. But I wanted to mention, um, right now is like that time of the year where it's a magical time where sometimes baseball cards go on sale. And I was at Target, and it was like the Tops rep was there, like marking down the packs of certain cards. You have like a Tops polo on, or something? yeah, yeah, right. yes. Whoa. Yeah, I was like, whoa, that's. I was like, that's totally official. You know I was like, I mean? that's a job. Like they're like. Right? Guys, like... <laughs> Yeah, like, you just go around and put baseball cards in stores all day. I yeah. can do that. <laughs> and, and so he had these, like, 25 and 30% off stickers, and he was, like, putting it on certain things. And um, he put it on a bunch of 2016 packs that they still had. Hmm. So I bought um, a pack of 2016 Topps Gypsy Queen, and I got a really cool Carlos... Quintana when he was on the White Sox last year. Nice. And he he's definitely turned into um, a, a good pitcher for the Cubs this late in the season. Um, yeah. His last outing, he was, like, untouchable. He pitched a yeah. complete game shutout. And so uh, I, I just thought it was cool. Everybody, now is the time. Go to your Walmarts and Targets, <laughs> and you and you may find clearance baseball cards. It doesn't happen yeah. that, that often. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Nice. Good, deal. good to know. Score. Yeah, you got you got a good one there in uh, in Quintana. Um, so, from, I mean, we got a good one. Jimenez is going to be right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. But yeah, at first I wasn't positive about the Quintana trade, but he's reliable, man. He's yeah. Solid. The best way to describe him, he's reliable. He's not going to like necessarily wow you all the time, but um, he's 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 a very he's a quality pitcher. Uh, yeah. Underrated, I think. So, I, and I think this will be the first time he's ever pitched in the playoffs. So oh yeah, yeah. He's pretty excited about that. So I would imagine, maybe yeah, he'll, he'll kind of take him over the top a little bit. Good, yeah. So, so yeah, good stuff, man. So head on out and get some baseball cards. Nice. How many packs did you buy, Levi? Uh, like three. Just three. <laughs> that was that was very no, I, restrained wait, of you. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, well, they had any more, you know, like the small packs are still like a buck ninety nine or two mm -hmm. ninety nine, I think. And so then, if you want, like, uh, you actually want more than ten cards or whatever, you got to go for the jumbo like rack packs, and those are like five six dollars now. Have you? I, I've come close to getting the sticker book again and just going buying stickers. <laughs> Have you guys thought about that? Because <laughs> they still sell the stickers, and the stickers are cheap. <laughs> they do, yeah. 
what's funny is I see that stuff a lot of times at the Dollar Tree. If I'm at the Dollar Ooh, Tree, good tip. It's happened. Like sometimes it'll be random. Like they'll have the baseball ones, then they'll have like FIFA World Soccer sticker mm-hmm. books, mm-hmm. like an NBA sticker book. And these are just like logos and stuff, or what? No, what are they? The players stickers. Of- oh, it's the cards. Yeah, like, yeah, well, yeah, so each page will have the team, and, and as ah. you get the stickers, you put each player in his spot on the, on the page, and so you try oh, to nice. collect all, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah I, I thought about it, just because it seems, yeah, a little bit of a cheaper route than collecting collecting cards. And it's got a, you know, a more old school vibe to it. Yeah, I yeah. mean, cards is old school kind it's, of it's, it's, it's more completist. It's it's easier to attain yeah. completion, I would I would think in a way. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. More satisfying. But cool. Yeah. Oh, Next time hey. get a line on one of those tops polos that dude would play with, <laughs> all right? Yeah. I wanna <laughs> I want to, I mean, you guys are gonna keep me up all night. I'm gonna be going on eBay looking for like Fleer windbreakers. <laughs> score a bitch, score headband. Right, right. I, I was wearing my tops uh, t-shirt, which I wear yeah. like twice a week. I wore it at uh, Broken Social Scene uh, the other night in St. Louis, and uh, while the lead singer was was crooning from in the crowd, he. He he gave me a shout out. He 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 liked the tops logo. He 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 uh, he was hip. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Deal. Um. Well, I'll go. I'll go next, and then Jonathan can close out the uh, grab bag portion. I saw this. I'm taking this from. I believe it was Classic Rock Magazine. Uh, which, if you follow it on, um, Facebook, I think it's like Team Rock. It's it's labeled as I think, I think it's the same thing though. I, that might be the parent company. I'm, I'm not sure, but anyway, I believe it was Team Rock or Classic Rock Magazine posted a poll, and I didn't look at the responses because I thought I would share it on our. Sh- I thought I would ask you guys the question on our show. What's the best, or I guess we could say fit your favorite? And I'm going to modify the question a little bit. Um, your favorite non-American or British rock band. And I'm going to throw in Irish as well, because there's a lot of good Irish bands. So we'll take them out of the equation as well. So what's your favorite band, not from the United States, Britain, or Ireland? And I don't know if we're all going to have the same answer or not. Um, but, uh, yeah, so chew on that. I'm going to I'm gonna throw – I'll start to throw down uh, – but I don't know how well thought out it is, but I know that they're some of my most recent favorite bands from not those countries. Um, uh, uh, one is called Papoos, P-A-P-O-O-Z. They're from France. They sing in English, so that's that's fine. Um, uh, a, a great band from Brazil uh, is is called uh, Oterno. Oterno is, is great. O space t-e-r-n-o uh, so those are a couple that I just just thought of how about you Ken? all right I, I, the, off the top of my head the first thing would be acdc fuck yeah, yeah <laughs> like, exactly. like, I, like, like if we're going out... <laughs> right, right. Like, Wait, did, I, you, yeah, that's... did you say not canada either oh no i didn't say not canada so maybe yeah. not north america because canada i guess we be... can eliminate yeah all right yeah. the question's been yeah. kind of molding the question now but um yeah wine damn <laughs> right yeah because then then it's obviously it's rush or neil young right um, yeah 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 that's a lot too. sorry i should have thought this out guys no, no, no. Um, it's, a, it's, a good, um, it's a good question yeah well let's you know what yeah well, both the bands jonathan mentioned aren't from canada so well i'll throw in there and they can't be canadian or or um for that as well uh acdc obviously was the first choice that comes to mind if i had to pick another one well, I'm gonna go with the Scorpions. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah they were just in nice. town the other night. I wish I would have able to go. Um, yeah, I'll go. I'll go I, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. ACDC and the Scorpions are the first to come to mind. Um, yeah, uh, check out. Uh, there's another great band. They just got nominated for a Latin Grammy uh, called the the Baggios, B A G G I O S, uh-huh. and uh, they, they've got a couple albums under their belt. They're currently touring in the united states and uh 
they they rock, man. They, they they'll they'll make the noise with as a two piece or a three piece, but they they rock. Check out the Baggios. Right. Ooh. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to look at it. Thank you for that suggestion. I'm not going to look anybody up because, you know, it's kind of going to be it's supposed to be off the top of your head. Um, yeah, because I was wondering, like, where's Crocus fo- from? I think Crocus, <laughs> is pretty, I think Crocus is pretty underrated. I, I, I don't yeah, know Crocus, Nectar I think Crocus, and Plastic Bertrands. <laughs> I, think Crocus, I think Crocus might be from Germany or maybe the Netherlands. I'm not sure. But, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll go, I mean, yeah, ACDC and the Scorps are the first that come to mind. So, yeah, uh, I'm sure there's... There's some others I'm forgetting about. I mean, obviously, like, you know, for newer bands, look at someone like uh, Tanarwin, you know. Tanarwin, well. yeah. yeah. Um, Adam Ali, uh, Cigaros yeah. out of Iceland. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. There's there's others. I, well, yeah, I mean, he was like, I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, it's like Fela Kuti would be one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Sure, sure. All his records kick ass. <laughs> uh, there, there's a really, uh, there's, there's a pretty good band out of, Israel, uh, I think it's Israel, and they sound very much of a dire, have a Dire Straits influence, but their name is escaping me right now. I'll include it in the show notes. <laughs> uh, but a contemporary band, uh, yeah. but uh, yeah, heavy Dire Straits influence there. Yeah, I, I guess like you know the question when they posed it was kind of like probably geared towards a classic rock right. audience. Yeah, because there are there. I mean, like there is a ton of awesome, you know. Um, like heavier bands, you know, that are from Scandinavian countries, you know, that are, that are mm-hmm. awesome. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, so I, I would imagine if you looked at the comments, it was just like ACDC after ACDC. <laughs> after ACDC. <laughs> yeah, so probably went something like that. Yeah, I mean, both with, with classic rock bands, it, it is really harder to think of because there just wasn't the distribution back then to, to break a band. Uh, especially if you didn't sing in English. I mean, there were a ton of bands making music then. I mean, there was like, there was like a big like Iranian rock scene, you mm-hmm. know. Like, I mean, it's and it's really good too. It's mm-hmm. really good music. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, know, you you didn't. Nobody in the seventies in the states was able to hear any of that. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We kind of rely on these compilations made by you know these these kind of lighten in the lighten the attic records or uh, um, numero. Uh, uh, numero records. Um, yeah. Uh, to, for them to dig all that up for us. Yeah. So a lot of good stuff out there. That, that, that sounds like a good challenge, actually. Over the next week, I'm going to try to find. We should all try to find a a, a really good pre 1980 classic rock band. Yeah. Um, all right. From Looks none of those countries. Show. Yeah. Homework assignment. There you go. Nice. nice. Good one. Yeah. No, it's so cool. I mean, I, I you know. I, I, one of the advantages of the internet now is, you know, you're able to discover that stuff with somewhat ease. You know, I mean, you can just type in, you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Little did I know there was like, and I, I'm I'm just being hypothetical here. There was a, there was a great soul scene in the Philippines in the late '70s. You know, I I don't know if that was the case. Psychedelic but, soul, know. yes. Actually, right, yeah, right. We, I think we have a compilation. <laughs> okay, maybe. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, the, the compilations are crazy nowadays. I think I have one that's like an introduction to psychedelic salsa. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. freaking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Some great stuff out there, man. The rabbit hole is deep. So. Yep. Yeah. All right. Alrighty. Well, um, yeah, so to wrap up then the grab bag, uh, I got very excited when I learned of a weekend stint that is being played at the Greek Theater in Berkeley, uh, California, in October. Uh, I'm not going, but I'm still very excited. Uh, the National... Uh, is playing two nights, uh, Saturday and Sunday. On Saturday, uh, actually, technically, they're only playing one night. The Saturday, they're playing a Saturday night show. And then the next day, they come back, and they're playing a 3.30 p.m. matinee at the Greek Theater. And kids under 10 get in for free. That's awesome. And the the matinee, the Sunday matinee, is something that I've always talked about doing. If I had, you know, like if I had a music venue, I would have, you know, I would hold, uh, you know, like two or three or four p.m. shows on Sundays, just because it would be kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, it'd be a different vibe. You would get out of the show, and it would be like, hey, let's go get some dinner or something. Right. And uh, so it, it would. Uh, that that was always one feature uh, that that I wanted uh, to to have my club uh, to make it unique. Uh, so my question to you guys is: if you had a, a music venue, 
are there any unique features that you would that you've always wanted to implement? Uh, I'll let you think yeah. about it real quick, and as as I as I state my uh, second one that I that I would do since uh, my wife is is uh, only about five foot. Um, there would be risers for people under five foot five. There you go. <laughs> you, you must be this tall to enjoy the yeah, concert. Yeah, you here. cannot be this taller than this to right, enjoy. Yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, because she could be in the third row, and but if somebody's like five six, she can't see shit. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that's that's just another example. Well, the first one that comes to mind for me is no cell phone policy. That's Meaning, a good or, one. Be, be, or I, well, I should say my cell phone policy would be you can't have one. Um, yeah. Uh, huh. Well, and that's actually I've always wondered if bands. I would ask my band to say, "Hey, let's do one song with all of the lights on, so that ev- and ask yeah. everybody to get their cell shots, and then to put away the cameras because all the other photos are going to look like shit in the dark light." Right. Right. I I think like if I was in charge of a place, I would be like Bill Graham and be like dinner and a show, yeah, like like last waltz style, yes. like yeah. every like every show have out like some kind of buffet or something in th- that's included in the price of your ticket. Yes, right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah that that would be good. I know, like um, a few uh, in that vein, and also related to San Francisco, when the mother hips like. Like went on hiatus back in like oh two oh three, you know they their final show they played until like five a.m. at wow. at Slim's, which is a smaller venue in San Francisco, and they they serve scrambled eggs to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that was there. So, yeah, yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. About it. yeah. <laughs> pretty. Cool. Yeah. So I have a show from yeah. Slim's. I'm trying to think who it is. I think it's was it like a secret Pearl Jam show? I believe be. possibly yeah. Yeah, it was like a. It was a. Yeah. It's one of the more well-known smaller venues in San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, it's still yeah. open. I think, so. Yeah, I take. Uh, I'd accept scrambled eggs at the end of a show. That, that yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially like five a.m. You know. Yeah, you like. Got some salt and pepper. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm. I, I like Levi's idea there. You know, just like I don't know, cookie a cookie at the door. I don't whatever. You yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah. Something. Yeah. Like, I don't know, make it more, I think it becomes more of an experience, not just to give me your money for the ticket, you're going to get beer spilled on, you have a good time. Right. You know what I mean? Like, make it more of, someone's always going to remember, man, that show was fucking awesome, and at the end, we got fucking pancakes. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Or something, you know, like, I don't know. I'm with you. I'm with you. (laughs) I like it. All right, we'll, we'll we'll start to collaborate on this club we open together. <laughs> yes, the no cell phone club that serves food and accommodates people that are under five feet, <laughs> and occasionally has shows at at noon on Saturdays. It's fish market, but we're gonna I mean, it. I mean, the only band I can think of that did that fairly, like the Dead did daytime shows. Did they? Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. went to the matinees, like Sunday yeah. shows a lot of times. Yeah, really? Yeah. Okay, I didn't realize that. Maybe that's yeah. where Nationals getting it from because they're big Dead fans, and this is in uh, Oakland, Berkeley. But yeah, so, right. yeah, nice. Huh? Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for the grab bag. We're gonna go ahead and go into the main portion of tonight's show, uh, which we are really excited about. We've got an interview with Danny Clinch. Now, Danny is an accomplished photographer, to say the least. His work has appeared in Rolling Stone, Spin, GQ, Vanity Fair. From Neil Young to Tupac, the Beastie Boys to Fish, Beck to Bruce Springsteen, Danny's portfolio reads like a roll call of current or future rock and rock hall inductees. But this photographer, the boss called the last of a breed, has also received three Grammy nominations as a director, which brings us to his latest work with Pearl Jam. Uh, During their two-night stint at Wrigley in the summer of 2016, Danny teamed up with the band to create a document that has turned into his latest film, Let's Play 2. While it hits some theaters in early October, it will also be shown on Fox Sports 1 after Game 1 of the ALCS on October 13th. 
Uh, in our chat, we cover Let's Play 2, uh, Danny's childhood experiences with baseball, and his work on the yet-to-be-released documentary of his good friend, the late, great Shannon Hoon of Blind Melon. So we hope you enjoy this interview with Danny Clinch. First off, uh, whose idea was it to create a concert film at Wrigley? You know, the band had played at Wrigley in 2013, and uh, it was incredible. They had a great time. It was a great you know, experience once uh, you know, the, uh, the weather cleared. Uh, I think everybody realized it was a um, pretty momentous occasion. And, um, you know, with the band's connection to Chicago and especially Ed having grown up in Evanston and all that, that uh, you know, there's that connection there, him being a Cubs fan and all that. And I thought uh, they thought, like, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's do a couple more shows, I guess. And, and um, when they started talking about it, uh, I got a call about possibly being a part of, uh, of filming it um, for posterity. And, uh, and there you go. Sure. And so the idea of uh, two day having two days instead of just one, uh, does that present you with more options as a director? Uh, yeah, I think it does. I think, um, you know, first of all, you want to hope that, um, you know, both, you know, the shows are going to go off and, and feel right. And, you know, everybody feel like they had a good show. And I've been around a lot of bands and, you know, people don't always feel that way at the end of a show. They can come off and they're like, yeah, it's it good, you know, or, you know, or they're shaking their head. And uh, I felt like, you know, the band really felt like they really nailed those shows. Uh, that's my opinion. And it felt like, um, you know, they really came through. The fans really loved it. Uh, and, you know, from the filming standpoint, we felt like we really captured something special. And, uh, and you know, we, we pulled from each uh, each of the nights. We didn't do just one night. And, um, and really what we were trying to do uh, in terms of choosing the set list that we chose was to keep the spirit of the band's original set list, how it started out kind of, you know, on the mellow tip and then kind of built up and had ebb and flow like they did, you know? Um, so that was, that was our initial way to choose, to begin to choose, um, you know, each of the, of the songs. So are you giving input on those set lists? I chose it. Oh, you did completely. Yeah. Wow. So take uh, yeah. me through that um, process. You know, along with, well, you know, when I say I chose it, uh, I, I mean we, you know, like, te you know, uh, filmmaking is, is teamwork. And, you know, I sat down with uh, with my creative team of, uh, you know, people, and um, specifically uh, my friend Tim and uh, Tim Donnelly. And we sat down and we were like, hmm, let's see. Uh, we don't want to leave any of these songs out. <laughs> However, we have a certain amount of time to fill up. And so we decided we would um, go with the spirit of what Pearl Jam had done, like the ebb and flow of like the build and the way they built up and the way they let it down and then came back up. And, and so, you know, there was our initial set list was, was very, very long. And, uh, you know, we had to pull back on a lot of it. Um, and it's, it was also what was important to us was what was the story that we were telling. And because the film then became after the, the Cubs, you know, started to continue their run to the World Series. I was like, man, we got to get out and film this. This could be epic, you know. And it ended up, uh, you know, going the direction we had hoped, which was uh, to the World Series. And so as that story progresses, as you're in the edit room, you're choosing songs for for maybe their connection to the scene before it or the scene after it, or, you know, when you're making a film, any connection you can have between two scenes or a song in a scene, uh, you know, helps it helps to keep the flow of the film. Sure. So it sounds like then yeah. the, the Cubs run uh, really helped dictate a, a, a lot of uh, the direction of this. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, is like we set out to make a concert film and, you know, the band, um, I've been working with them quite a while and they, they trust me. So they allow me to be in, in places that most people wouldn't, wouldn't be. Um, you know, we were, we were able to get, you know, some interviews here and there and just sort of like, you know, capture some really great moments backstage and, um, and other places that, um, that, you know, were really crucial to our storytelling. And after, those couple of days were through. Um, I was in a conversation with Eddie Vetter and uh, Theo Epstein. And I said, look, if the Cubs make a run, 
you know, I, I'm going to have to show back up with uh, with some cameras to document the insanity. And they said, yeah, we hope you will. And uh, and it all happened. And, and we jumped out there and chased it. And then, this, and then the, you know, the whole film became something else entirely. Um, you know, it became about the band uh, and the shows at Wrigley as well as uh, the Cubs. So it was, was something that was unexpected, but, uh, you know, we couldn't believe how lucky we were that it all came together like that. I, I can't imagine what other directors are thinking that you would, you would fall into that, that luck, you know, this team that hasn't won the world series in more than a hundred years. And here you are (laughs) creating a DV, a a concert film, the season that they're, they're on their run. It, It was crazy because, you know, the band's manager, um, and I had this conversation beforehand and he was like, he was like, Hey, you know, like, um, let's just capture it and we'll throw it to the universe. We know that cool things happen when you're around the band. And, uh, and he was like, and who knows, maybe the baseball gods will give us a world series run. And this was way in the beginning. Of course, we were all secretly thinking that. And, and I said, Hey man, I'm on board with it. Let's do it. So, uh, it was cool. Cause we were able to collaborate with, uh, the, the team that normally films all the Pearl Jam shows, their video crew and their guy named Blue. And uh, we were able to kind of like have the best of both worlds. We were able to, I was able to bring in some of my favorite camera operators and uh, directors of photography and team them up with uh, some of the Pearl Jam guys that know every nuance of every, uh, of every song. So it was really a, a great collaboration. Did uh, Wrigley, as a venue, present any unique uh, opportunities or challenges for shooting? Yeah, uh, it really did. It was, um, you know, you're in a beautiful, like, legendary, historic baseball field, baseball park. And the visual on that place is, is so incredible. The history that's there is incredible. And what's really unique about Wrigley is the rooftops around it and that Wrigleyville is a community and a neighborhood in itself. And when you walk out of the ballpark of Wrigley Field, you don't walk into a parking lot. You walk into a neighborhood. You know, you walk into uh, the Wrigleyville Tap. You walk into uh, Murphy's Bleachers. Uh, You walk into, you know, brownstones and families and restaurants. and, uh, and And you can watch from the rooftop. So one of the things that we did is we positioned a camera operator you know, up on one of the rooftops that overlooks the stadium. And uh, that was, you know, added a really interesting flavor. Uh, you have previously worked with Pearl Jam uh, on a, another concert film uh, set in Italy. Uh, first of all, will you pronounce the title of that film for me? Well, I am not Italian. <laughs> uh, however, um, I was told it's called Imagine in Cornice, which, which means picture in a frame in so many words. And we t- we took that title actually, a uh, picture in a frame, from a Tom Waits song, and Ed was playing that song backstage, uh, you know, during one of the you know, one of the shows during the run, and I thought, boy, what a what a wonderful sentiment, you know, th- that really encapsulates what what in in you know in a way what I was doing, which was capturing. Uh, those concerts in Italy, um, you know, for people to look at and to hear. And, you know, it just reminded me of a still photograph. And, you know, it, it wasn't really too hard to convince the band to have a Tom, a Tom Waits reference, <laughs> you know, in the title. <laughs> so we were all on board with that. And Tom was on board with it. And we were good to go. It's it's a beautiful film, uh, uh, Imagine in Corniche. And, and uh, it's uh, my favorite Pearl Jam concert film and one of my favorite concert films of any band and and uh, particularly because of you know it has a unique structure and editing and and it seems like you're given a lot of freedom with the, like the final notes on Rockin' in the Free World where you get like multiple final notes put in there or, or um, which mm-hmm. like segues into this you know really lovely shot of 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 Eddie Vedder in a bell tower essentially I, I'm assuming he's sweeping pigeon shit uh, up there <laughs> um, do, do you feel like you're given more freedom to take chances uh, than most concert film directors get? Yeah. Uh, I find that I'm very fortunate. Um, you know, they, they encourage it. They encourage it really. Uh, Pearl Jam encourages uh, taking chances 
and uh, there's there's no rules you know and you'll see that in this film too i mean it's funny enough i mean it started out as a concert film it became a film about um about wrigley field about music about passion um you know about two shared passions you know music and baseball and interweaving that stuff is um is really you know it was a unique opportunity and, and and we tried to do it in our own way and not you know we want we want the pearl jam fans to love it we want baseball fans to love it we want fans of neither to love it um the story that's in there is is really uh uh is really a, a really cool story it's it's got a lot of feeling and it's you know like i said these two shared passions and um and i think um when you get back to taking chances with this band, um, they always encourage it. And, and I think, you know, if you, uh, I'm real excited to see, you know, how it's received by the fans. I think, um, you know, when you look at the way it's edited, the editing, um, the way we shot it is, is unique. It's artful, uh, as well as storytelling. So it's, it's pretty cool. What are your favorite moments in Pearl Jam songs? An obvious example is is, is the jump and even flow, and and you know everybody mm. is sure to have their camera out for that moment. Uh, mm-hmm. Are are there other more maybe subtle moments that um, uh, that that always present a great opportunity as a photographer? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, my favorite moments, te- you know, they there certainly are, are those moments, and they are they, those are epic moments. I'm a big fan of moments in between songs and uh, you know, if there's a conversation going on between two band members, I love that. And during the songs, I love the interplay between the band members. Like I, I especially, there are moments in the film where you see Jeff and Mike having a moment together. They're laughing. They're having a great time. You know, you see stone glance over to Matt and they have a little moment, you know, a little, a little conversation unspoken conversation uh, or a musical conversation where they, they just like, you see them just really enjoying themselves. Like, you know, Ed, Ed looking and communicating with Matt. Um, it, it's, it's, it, those are the things that I love seeing. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, there's been a photograph that has been floating around online ever since I took it. The one of Eddie jumping off the monitor. And um, I recall Ed looking over at Matt, like, okay, let me know when you're going to end this song because I'm about to leap off this monitor and we want to nail it, you know? <laughs> like, I could see it. I could see the conversation happening. <laughs> I could see Ed looking at him. I look at Matt and Matt's looking at him and I look up and I just get down, get down real low. I focus on the monitor ahead of time so I know it'll be in focus. And then here he comes. <laughs> and then I just grab it. It's a great shot. It's Thank it's an absolutely yeah. beautiful shot. Yeah. And we'll we'll link to that uh, from our website so that people can see what we're talking about. For sure. Um, then to, to switch uh, switch gears then a little bit to baseball. Mm. Uh, growing up, did you attend many uh, Major League Baseball games as a kid or collect baseball cards? You know, I did go to a couple of ball games. I wasn't obsessed with baseball. Um, I did appreciate it, though. Um, and I recall an epic baseball moment when I was a kid. Uh, my dad... Um, took me and a couple of my buddies to, to see the Yankees. It was a double header. I remember that. And I, I remember my dad saying, Oh, good Lord. Why did I, why did I take him to take us to a double header? You know, uh, you know, cause it's just so long. The games are so long and, and funny. I never thought about this, but uh, you know, the double header let's play too uh, is, you know, what Ernie Banks said. Uh, and that's why we named our film that, but the moment was um, that I remember and I'm not sure a lot of people can say this, but I saw Mickey Rivers hit it in the park home run because that guy was so fast. They were playing. It was the Yankees, and I think it was the Twins. And I just remember he hit a ball uh, in the outfield over the center fielder's head or in, or in the gap there, and he ran around the bases before anybody could throw that ball home. And <laughs> I'll never forget it. It's rare to see an inside the park home run, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you remember Mickey Rivers, but that guy was fast. Oh, he had some Um, wheels. So, yeah. Yeah. Getting to meet some of the Cubs players and being in the, uh, 
the magical place of Wrigley Field, uh, meeting Theo um, and and Joe Madden, you know John Lester, all those guys. I mean, I got swept up in it big time. Like I got, I really got swept up in it. It was really, uh, it was magical for me. And you know, they obviously they they gained a, a new Cubs fan, uh, me and a whole bunch of the people on my crew. <laughs> And, you know, just feeling like we were part of something really special. Oh, yeah. How could you not? Oh, what a remarkable yeah. opportunity. Is there a baseball player that you would uh, like to photograph? Oh, a ball player? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, I was fortunate enough to photograph Randy Banks uh, with Betty, believe it or not, and with Jeff Amen, um, when, you know, uh, and with the band when they did the shows at Wrigley. Um. A uh, ball player that's, you know, I tell you, I probably would have a good time photographing Pete Rose. I don't know. I don't know what that says about me, but <laughs> <laughs> he's a character. I love a scrappy dude. Yeah, scrappy characters are are right in line with uh, good photo subjects for sure. So I'm going to hit you with one more baseball question, and then I want to I'm going to ask you about Shannon Hoon. Um, uh, what would be your walk up song? Oh man. Hmm. I like that. I like these questions, dude. You're really you got some good ones. Gosh. I keep thinking of growing up by Bruce Springsteen, but you know, I don't know why just because it's such a rebel song in a way. Um, but it doesn't have much to do with baseball. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, man. You, uh, you, you play growing up in a baseball stadium and then you kind of got like a bunch of fathers and sons really getting a little reflective all of a sudden. <laughs> that's true uh yeah I, i'm just trying to avoid the obvious ones you know yeah that's yeah all. yeah uh you know foger to uh, center field or something like that um I'd, I'd choose fortunate son before uh you know center field certainly um all right let's talk about something else I'll keep thinking about <laughs> okay <it. laughs> growing up right, let me let me give you a couple options i think it could be growing up could be could be growing up could be um johnny be good that would not be a bad one. Chuck Berry. You can't go wrong with Chuck Berry. Let me try one more. Let's see what else I come to. Uh, what about a Pearl Jam song? I don't know. I just would go with Lucan. Lucan, nice. Just bring that. Bring nice. the energy. Just bring the energy. I oh, I can feel the energy. Absolutely. <laughs> you, you might actually get the whole song in too if you take your time going up to the plate. It would be so good, and then he, <laughs> yeah, and then he just screams at the end. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I don't want to keep you here too much longer. I do just have uh, uh, a quick question though about uh, this Shannon Hoon project. Shannon Hoon, uh, the yeah. late lead singer of Blind Melon, uh, and one of the most yep. enigmatic uh, lead singers uh, of his generation. Shannon was a friend of mine. I'm still really good friends with the band. Uh, some of my best friends. Um, you know, it took a long time to get to know Shannon. You know, and I had a short time to get to know him and uh we had really become friends i i talked to him a lot and and uh i probably started this film 10 years ago and you know it was it was going to be a different film it was going to be about the band surviving after shannon uh and that and, and and you know their journey there and then we realized that shannon had a box of all these tapes that he had shot uh, he was a relentless documentarian and he was filming all the time. This is before anybody even had a phone that could film, you know, um, he just continued to film and continued to film. And at a certain point in the project, the bass player, Brad Smith said to me, um, you know, this could be a film that is all completely shown through Shannon's eyes, you know? And I thought, you know, you're absolutely right. And, and Shannon's um, daughter, Nico and Nico's mom, gave me this box of tapes and there's like 200 hours worth of footage and stuff in there. And, um, I had to comb through that in order to get it to where it is now. And the thing about it is that, um, we finally got through, you know, all that footage and, you know, it's taken quite some time to just get sign off from everybody involved in the project and stuff. And then, and now we're about to embark on another round of editing and, um, you know, it's a lot of work and, uh, it's a very long project. And I know we did it. We did a, a great fundraiser. Uh, you know, we did a Kickstarter, uh, and we got some money to get us to where we are right now. 
and uh, and and now we're just looking for some more funds where we're able to um, to take care of the, uh, the you know the music rights and you know it, it's real it's real complicated. People think like, well, the band's in, on board, can't they just say go ahead and use it? You know, and uh, and there's like record companies and there's publishing companies and then there's all the all the stuff that Shannon has filmed like on TV. Uh, all the all the like stuff on David Letterman and on Saturday Night Live and all that stuff uh, costs money to use and um, and so right now we're just um, we're excited about the next steps. Um, that's what's important. I'm really optimistic that it's going to be a very very unique portrait uh, because it is shown through Shannon's eyes. And there's some real real special moments that we have. I mean him doing demos in his bedroom or on the, on a hotel, you know, on the road in a hotel room, um, really personal stuff. Um, it's really going to be epic. And, but there's been some really cool discoveries, you know, like there's been moments where he, where he's referencing me in the, in the footage. And, you know, like I hear him talk, saying something about me or there was just one really, really funny moment that, I knew existed because I lived it, but I didn't, I'd never seen it. And it was this moment, uh, which may or may not make it in the film. I would think it might, <laughs> uh, but where I was in the airport with the band and we were coming back from like Amsterdam or something. And, uh, somebody says something like, um, okay, everybody, you know, everybody got their passports. And we're all like, yeah, yeah, we got our passports. We got them. You know? And I'm like, yeah, I got my passport. Where's my passport. I'm like, I'm like, shit, where's my passport? And I'm I'm looking around and I'm like starting to freak out. And I look over and there's Shannon holding my passport with ha- with my passport photo in the side of one side of the frame and then me freaking out in the other side of the frame. Like, where's my passport? <laughs> and so if you wanna get the if you wanna know what Shannon was like, <laughs> there you go. In a nutshell. <laughs> Oh, that's great. He was a mischievous character who loved to have a good time and laugh and and all that. So, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, we're excited. We're patient. um, Yeah. Appreciate uh, that. Yeah. We we wish you the best in in getting the rest of that put together. And um, I appreciate that big time. Yeah. Yeah. And and, yeah, just know that there are a lot of fans out there. And uh, Shannon Hoon is still a very important songwriter in in the hearts of, of me and many of my friends. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, man, we're going to, you know, it's going to happen. Uh, I'm going to uh, leave it at that, I think. And okay. uh, we're going to be uh, looking forward to this screening here in the fir- at the end of the first week of October. Yeah, let's play two. It's, it's, awesome. Um, it's going to be a blast. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, I think you're going to, I think you're going to dig it. It's, it's really, you know, the thing that I have, I think that, uh, you know, the, the important thing is that I have a great relationship with them and they, they give me the access, you know, so I'm capturing things. They're comfortable with me around and I'm capturing things that I don't know would have been captured otherwise, you know, and it really creates a really nice portrait of, of the band. And you get to see things you don't normally get to see. And I think that's what I'm bringing to the table uh, with this film as well. So, well, thanks, man. Let's play too. All right. Thanks, Danny. Have a good one. I'd like to thank Danny again for taking the time to be with us. You can visit dannyclinch.com to learn more about Danny and his work. Let's play two. uh, And we'll have a limited theatrical release in early October. Visit letsplay2film.com to find a list of theaters across the country. If it's not screening in your neck of the woods, then catch it on Fox Sports 1 after Game 1 of the American League Championship Series on October 13th. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get into the show your cards portion of the show. Uh, this is where we share a baseball card um, and you know, talk a little bit about the significance of the card. So um, we want to go ahead and start it off here. Uh, I will begin tonight, guys. I'll, uh, I'll go first. I'll take the liberties there. Um, now, this card... Um, this is interesting because I I have seen late edition cards, right? You guys remember those. Um, where No, they would be, or extended series? Okay. Series 2 type. Series two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'm butchering the terminology a little bit. Well, no, but, I um, think the different sets called it different things. Right. Okay. 
So this would be a card. Um, it would be like maybe a rookie who was like called up in the middle of the season. Maybe a trade that happened, right? Um, Some like, of the, they used to call them high number cards. Yeah, high number. Look, let me give you an example. I think Levi shared it on the show before, and it's a relatively well known card from um, the mid '80s. The '86 tops with Bo Jackson, right? That's an extended series card, right? Because he came up in '86. Yeah, but I think that eight, was the traded. Series. Yeah, yeah, '86 cards though document the 1985 stats, so hence mm-hmm. the extended series. Anyway, now I don't know if this one. I don't think it fits. It's not a high number card, um, but I don't know if it fits the bill. And you, you guys have probably seen this card. Um, let me hold it up here. Can you guys see it? Okay. Nice. Eight, uh-huh. 89 yeah, there you go. Davis. It's an 89 Jody Davis, right? Um, Looks glossy. Seen before, but if you look right here, it says now with braids. Oh yeah. I, yeah, I, I kind of remember cause I got, I had that set when it was new. I yeah. kind of remember that on that card. I look it, back. It was like, it was, it was almost, it was like tops way of somehow trying to update because, you know, sometimes now they'll have a picture of a guy and it'll be in, like, a Blue Jays outfit, but it'll say he's on Oakland. Right. You see that now with the uniform doesn't match the label. But, yeah, this is – Yeah. He, he, he went to the Braves. He only played two games for the Braves hmm. in 88. Um, eight at-bats. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, the, that's So, I, I, I've – you know, I, I, I don't know if it's an extended series or not, but I've um, – I, I this is this is the this is the I, I didn't recall this being on there until I stumbled across the card. What's the so. uh, what's the number of the card on the back? One fifteen. Okay, so it sounds like it's a standard set, but I think yeah. so. But yeah, yeah I, I, and yeah, I, was, I I wasn't sure if all of them said this. You know, I'll have to do some research there. But yeah, huh. so yeah, cool. now with the, Braves card. Yeah, the, uh, it's very subtle. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like it's black type. Well, and and I know. wonder. Part of me thinks, man, now that we're Thinking about it, the '89 tops may be the only year I've ever seen that. It's it's funny but where it's, it says it in print like that. It's kind of a cop out too, because like, what's the discussion that's being held at the tops headquarters where they're like, "Gosh, we we got to look up to date here. We can't like, <laughs> you know, we we can't let this pass without acknowledging it." It's like, well, if you're a baseball fan, you know if he's. You know, if he was recently traded and you understand yeah. that, that they couldn't feasibly print the card and of him in a Braves uniform. And, and like, so your solution is just to type on there, essentially, now with Braves. <laughs> what's, right. What's the point? Just leave it as the Cubs. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> we'll catch up with them next year. You got to document <laughs> these two games that he played for the Braves. So actually, it makes me wonder, is there a Jody Davis card <laughs> of him in a Braves uniform if he only spent a couple games with them? Why well, don't I? Maybe he played with them the next season, you know? Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. He may have played all of 89 for them. I don't know. Yeah. 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 That's funny. Huh. Joe Davis. He was one of my favorite Cubs. Oh, yeah. Good old Joe Davis. Um, my card is from the Gypsy Queen pack set a lot. And in the Gypsy Queen set, they do like legends cards. Like, and, and and this is how it is on most all the extra sets like this. Not everyone in the whole team is on a Gypsy Queen card. So, like, I think the Cubs Gypsy Queen team set is only, like, eight cards. And we know there's more than eight Cubs. But um, usually they devote one or two of those cards, though, in that set to legends of the teams. And um, I thought this was a cool card. It's... Goose Gossage when he was on the Yankees and he's got a killer looking stash and hair going yeah. right there as well. Yeah. And uh looking up Goose's stats, man, I didn't realize he started out on the South Side game. He was he was a yeah. white South. Yep. Yep. And um I, I do remember he played for us in eighty eight. He was a cubby. And uh he got around, man, but considered enough of a Yankee legend to uh to get into the Gypsy Queen team set for the Yankees. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Now, so I guess the Yankees are like the definitive team that he played for, I guess, right? Did he play for the Braves, too? <laughs> well, I think... Okay. Um, um, it says on the Yankees, he ranks second in the list of career saves 
of more than three outs. Uh, he played for a, he played for a lot of teams. I'm looking now. Yeah, his, yeah. His yeah. Page. yeah. His, uh, his career saves total there is eight shy of Raleigh fingers. And I think he won a series or two with the Yankees, so that would that would help cement your position uh, right. with with the Yankees. Yeah, that's mm. good. Played with the Cubs in '88. Just yep, yep, brief. Yeah, oh, he's, yeah, he's got a pretty good collection of uniform numbers on BaseballReference.com. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, wow. Well, this this is a. This is a perfect segue into my card, which is another relief man, Lee Smith. Uh, I apologize if I've shown this card on here before. Um, but it, it's like one of the only Cubs that I have, and I wanted to show a Cubs card. Um, like, if I, my skills are still on, is that an 83 Fleer? This is an 82 Fleer. 82. Ah, one but year it's, it's an error card uh, because the Cubs logo is upside down on the back. Oh, wow, that's funny. Yeah, uh, and and so I did some research, and the error is actually worth less than the corrected version, <laughs> because that was in the eighties a lot of times because they fixed it so late in the run, probably. But uh, uh, so yeah, I, I looked up Lee Smith. Uh, obviously, we all kind of generally know about Lee Smith, Levi. You probably more than uh, than us, but um, so the eighty two was the last year he started a game. He started five games in eighty two. Uh, mm. And after that, he was he was forever a relief pitcher. And, and so I looked at some of the I I, I looked at so, some of those relief stats. And Levi, early you referenced the idea of um, three plus inning saves. Was that right with yeah. Chris Gossage? Yeah. So that's exactly what I looked. I was looking at with and nearly what I was looking at with Lee Smith, which was in '83. So the next year, he led the league with just 29 saves, but he pitched 103 innings. Mm. And so 24 times that year, he pitched two or more innings. Uh, by contrast, Mariano Rivera's career high in innings pitched was 80 as a closer. And only four times that year did he pitch two or more innings. Um, and then to take it to an extreme, when Francisco Rodriguez saved 62 games in 2008, he never pitched more than one inning. <laughs> yeah, so the, 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 oh, yeah, the yeah, relief the old pitcher has yeah, were tough. It's evolved. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Now it's, it's all uh, it's one and done. You know what I mean? Get one guy. You know, have a seventh and eighth and a ninth guy. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, and some guys just out there to get two outs, one out. You know, but yeah, Lee Smith. He he would pitch a hundred innings in '83. Nice. Wow. Hmm. Good stuff. Well, thanks for sharing, uh, everybody. And always enjoy the show your cards portion. Uh, please show us your cards too on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, give us a tag. Give us a give us a shout out there, and also please review the podcast for iTunes. Uh, however you listen, uh, just please let us know how we're doing. You can find us on all the major podcasting apps. You can find everything about Rock and Roll Shinsu Chu archived episodes, uh, a lot of other cool stuff at rockchu.com. And you can follow us on the Twitter and Instagram at RockNChu. That's N as in this is not the Cardinals year, Levi. I thought you'd appreciate that one. Um, so Trolling. Follow us on social media, please. Like us on Facebook as well. Uh, tell all your friends and family members to tune in, please. And until next time, big thanks to Danny Clinch. And uh, we will see you soon. Take care. Good night. Peace.